this is my favorite thing of the whole thing, so it's a little clapboard. Oh, wow, that is so awesome. Yes, yes. so we have- so official. Listen, we try, we try, we try our best. Did you get Janine, the thing on Amazon? Janine, absolutely, everything on Amazon. Everything on Amazon. I wanna get one. Everything on Amazon. You can buy small clapboards, big back clapboards. You could buy anything you can dry dream erase of. clapboards. You can buy anything on Amazon. So I yes, it. I bought this mic on Amazon. I mean, what are you going to do? It's sponsored. We're sponsored by Amazon. Not really. Amazon. Yes. Not really. Oh my God. Not I really. Wish. We wish. We wish. Plug us. Um, give us free gift cards. Yeah, for oh. real. For real. So we are joined on two Wash Ups, one pro with a very special Olympic gold medalist pro, Janine Ooh. Becky, a Red Raider, Go Tech. Uh, Man City, yeah, rock. Is that what it is? Rockham, Reckham, Reckham. Like, that's right. Reckham. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, Reckham. awesome. Yep. A current Man City <laughs> star, an Olympic Canadian gold medalist. I mean, the list could go on. Thank you so much for joining us in your jump man kit. Go Nike as well. Love to see that. How are you doing? What's going well, on? Well, thanks for having me. Super happy to be here. I'm good. Uh, I think summer's officially over in England. It is really Oof. gray and rainy. So this is what my life will be for the next 10 months. But you know, you get used to it. You get used to it. So yeah. uh, the summer was nice while it lasted, but no more sun for me. How long does the summer last over there? Oh gosh, it starts to get like warm mm -hmm. at the end of, end of May. And okay. then- Oh, usually around this time it starts to cool off so it's not too bad it's just that i'm never here when it's warm because i'm not here during the summer yep. so, so you get you get all the the, the gray of England. i get the winter which is super fun but you're canadian but not, i'm used to it you're I'm also used to it. Col colorado Col colorado colorado mm. yes colorado. which also is uh intense winter so yes i really shouldn't complain i'm, I'm used to it we're good <laughs> everything's good <laughs> Well, hopefully there's a little bit of sunshine left, but we'll see. <laughs> um, we want to get right into it in regards to your youth. Um, so let's go back to mini Janine. Mm -hmm. You were part of the U.S. system. Mm -hmm. Brought in to the 18s, 20s. And then ultimately, both your parents are born and raised in Canada. You decide to make the jump to the Canadian side of things. Talk about that what led you to that decision ultimately um especially being a player that was getting seen at the u.s level it wasn't like there was more just more opportunity i think obviously you had an opportunity with both countries yeah talk about what led to that decision and obviously it's paid off but um yeah how did you get onto the canadian youth national teams and obviously now in the full yeah, well, credit to you guys because you've done your research and you got the story right because the story has gotten misconstrued many times. Yeah. I've lived in Canada. I'm from Canada. No, it's not. That's not true. You guys got it. I love it. Um, yeah, so it definitely wasn't for lack of opportunity. Um, I had great opportunity with the U.S. system. I was consistently a face in camps between probably yeah, the under 18s and under 20s. And then the under 20 World Cup was coming around the corner and you know, as you both know, the player pool in the U.S. is just quite massive. Um, and that was, you know, became, <laughs> yeah, it became pretty clear to me pretty quick that the, you know, it was stiff competition in the U.S. And not that that's a bad thing. I think that's why, you know, they're so successful. Um, but for me, you know, I started to think, what's the quickest path to the senior team for me? And that's something that I had in my dreams for my early 20s like it wasn't something I wanted to wait till I was you know 25 26 to get an opportunity to play with the senior team and um it was a few months before the under 20 world cup and I just got a phone call from Andrew Olivieri who was the under 20 Canadian coach at the time and he just said we've been tracking you for a while we understand you have you know the ability to play for Canada have you ever thought about it and I was like to be honest not really um <laughs> he was like FIFA rules say you can come participate in a camp with us and if you're you know it's not for you whatever you can go back and, and continue to play for the U.S. so had some conversations you know with my family with some coaches and and I thought you know kind of why not um and so I went up there and 
really, really enjoyed myself. Uh, felt like I fit in from a, from a soccer perspective, but also from, you know, a human being perspective. I, I got along really well with, with the girls and it was, it was a good path for me. So then I had to, you know, make my decision on what I was going to do for the under twenties, which was already a difficult decision because a lot of my really good friends were on that team at the time. Uh, we had a really good group and it wasn't that I didn't think I could make the team. I just knew that there was probably a solidified spot for me on the Canadian under 20 team. And the under 20 world cup was, was what I really wanted to do at the time. So, um, yeah, I think it was, uh, Frenchie, that was the yep. coach. And then, uh, April Heinrich was obviously incredibly involved. So had to have some tough conversations with them. You know, they said, understandably, you know, if you go do this, it makes it that much harder, you know, if you want to come back. And I said, I understand that. Uh, so that was a hard decision for me to make. And I have absolutely no animosity towards us soccer. They always treated me very, very well. And they were very respectful when I made the decision to go play in the under 20 world cup. So yeah, I did that. And then I think it was, so that was in the summer, obviously. And then I think it was November. I made my first senior cap. So it all happened really fast. Um, yeah. and yeah, like you said, it's worked out all right for me. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Cause that's where, you know, we met, I'm pretty sure, uh, was mm -hmm. with the twenties. And, um, I think at least for me, I'm like, the quicker you can get to where you want to be the better. And mm -hmm. so for me, I was like, you go girl, like, like you go get that, go get on the senior team. <laughs> like you have that opportunity, which a lot of the, the, the players in that youth system where it is so crowded, don't have that opportunity. So like, mm -hmm. I was like, girl, you go get that, like, get it. <laughs> Cause well, I, I think mean, too, it's, you have to appreciate like the honesty in, in your approach, because I feel like it just makes a greater point of like training is super important but getting like live game action and training and playing with the best players is very important um and I think it's something that can even relate to people that are making like college decisions it's like you mm -hmm. can't just go to a school because they want you it's like did you think about fit do you think about whether you're going to play do you think about how you fit in their system where would you play how would you exactly play? yeah um and like, to your point, right. You've been a staple for Canada for a while now. And, um, I can only imagine, like, you would think that like, you've gotten even so much experience and even better earlier in your career than maybe you would have learned just sticking with the U S kind of system, um, and going that route. It also takes yeah. I mean, credit to you. That takes a lot of guts because I know like, guts. like to your point, the, the story's wrong, right? <laughs> like you grew up in the United States. We, it's such a small circle. So it's like, Oh yeah. You make that decision. You play college in the U S you've played in the NWSL for a while. It's like, you don't know how people are going to take that or, you know, it's sometimes it's hard to like block out the noise, but, um, clearly just I, a really good decision. I find that, I find that interesting that that story is misconstrued. I don't know why. Well, why do you think that I think, is? I think it's a, <laughs> sometimes a lack of, uh, research. And yeah. it's just, it's like, I've told the story so many times and I still like read articles about myself and I'm like, yeah, that's not true. Uh, <laughs> I did not ever live in Canada. I'm, I was not born there. So you're yeah, a real I mean, Colorado think, kid, right? You play for real Colorado. I am. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Real look Colorado in the ECNL forever. records. I mean, look in the ECNL records reporters. Come you know, on now. Just dig a little deeper people. But yeah, I think <laughs> it's, uh, it's a tough one because you know, I grew up in the States, born and raised in Colorado, totally engulfed in the American sports culture. Mm -hmm, and, right. you know, I will, I will honestly say when I was young, I, you know, it was an American Olympian that I dreamed to be. I mm -hmm. dreamed of, of competing in the Olympics for the U S and it's so strange to say that now sitting here at having yeah. won the Olympics with Canada. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I have, I feel so much pride playing for Canada and I would never, ever change my decision, but it was, it's just, it's strange to think about because you would have never, I would have never guessed that this would have been my path. And I think that that's, what's so special about and cool about, you know, players having the opportunity to play for different countries. And mm -hmm. there's that, there was a big story that came out about a bunch of uh, UK born players now playing for Jamaica. And it's just like, it's opportunity and it's great because it, it grows the game. It makes teams, sure. you know, better. And, um, 
yeah, I am obviously, I love every single second of playing for Canada. So I would never change that, yeah. but it, it was something that I really didn't even think was ever going to be an opportunity. I also will awesome. say you have kind of this, I feel like, I don't know if it's true, but based on your history, I feel like you have, you take on great challenges, like even, oh, you know, I mean, Texas tech, no, I'm saying like Texas tech. I mean, clearly you love the university. It seems as though publicly it's been an amazing experience, but like, mm-hmm. I'm sure you could have went to more of a staple soccer school potentially if you wanted yeah. Yeah, and I decided to take her out take took took a route that was a little less known and decided, mm-hmm. okay, I'm going to make my mark here because this is where I feel I fit best. Um, and that's yeah. not yeah. an easy decision to make, um, including the Canada decision, obviously, but, um, I just think that's fascinating that you kind of have gone your own way and not really followed the, um, I don't want to say the typical way, but I think a lot of us have gone the way of like traditional. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, obviously you guys know, but for those that don't necessarily know, you know, college women's soccer, there's those, you know, there's those dream schools that everyone wants to go to. Obviously, right. Joe, you got to be involved in such a great program. That's one of them. I had aspirations of playing in North Carolina. I don't know a lot of young people that don't because it's just one of those places. It's like North Carolina, Stanford, UCLA, like I think Virginia's thrown their name in there. Like there's these big, big programs. But for me, when I was going through the recruiting process, I think it was a really important, you know, decision to one. I think one of the biggest things is to go somewhere where you would love to be if you weren't an athlete. For sure. And I love, I love the university. It's such a great atmosphere in college town, but I also wanted to go somewhere where I was going to play for my freshman year. Mm -hmm. And that was really important for me to, you know, I obviously didn't know for sure, but I gave myself a good chance, you know, going to tech and the coach there is amazing. We're still super Stony. close, but yeah, Mr. Tommy Stone, um, shout out to him. I'll tell him mm-hmm. to listen to this so that he, he can hear that. He'll be buzzing. So my he cousin, was about. Yeah. So my cousin actually coached with him at Clemson. What a small world. Oh, I know. Can you believe wow. that? That's yeah. crazy. Joe, yeah. before you get into before you get into the next question, I will note though, Texas Tech fans are rowdy. Okay. We played them in the national championship. And I was yes. like, I mean, to be fair, we got the best of them, but it was a really insane game. That I was in that was arena. Insane. I went to the you game. You went? Oh my gosh. I went. I was like, this is like in. I mean, these fans it's don't play. It's a whole play. another level. They no. don't play. If you don't know about fan, they do Patty not play Mahomes. At Texas Patty Tech. Mahomes went there too, right? Uh huh. Yeah. yeah, we were at Tech at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, they Ooh. don't play. They don't play in Texas, especially Texas Tech. Don't people don't know that? I feel like I feel like don't it's like mess, an under. Don't mess with Texas one in general, but <laughs> Texas, Texas, <laughs> Texas Tech, Tech fans, fans are like cray cray. Like I was like, I'm a little scared soul. getting out of here. Yeah, I they love bleed that. it. Yeah. I love that. So you crush it at tech. You wrecked them. Thank you. Then you, yeah, wrecked. I got the hand signal. Surprise. Like this is still loud, but it's one finger. It's one finger. Okay. It's one one finger. finger. Just one finger. One One finger. Okay. One finger. You wrecked it. Get it right, girl. I know. Sorry, sorry, sorry. And then you were drafted by Houston in the NWSL. Mm -hmm. Treated later to Sky Blue during the dismal season of Sky Blue. (laughs) Um. (laughs) You then midseason, you know, um, went over to Man City. One, talk a little bit about the decision to leave the NWSL and then talk about Man City. I can't even imagine yeah. playing for Man City. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's, not, it's not a bad place to be. Um, <laughs> yeah, I loved playing in the NWSL. I think it was a big staple in the beginning of my professional career and definitely somewhere that I want to come back to at some point and I love to see the growth that the the game is having over there um there's a lot of exciting cities coming into the league Mm -hmm. which hopefully you know all goes smoothly and and can really help the league out a lot and I hope to see more internationals come come to the league because it just keeps getting better right and then I think the the more transfers you can have between leagues it's just better for everybody it's better for the game in general excuse me and yeah so (sighs) Not the best season at Sky Blue. I think (laughs) that's pretty widely known now. I didn't win a single game with them, which is a hard reality to uh, face. But yeah, it was just, it was one of those things that I look back on my time at Sky Blue and I'm really thankful for the experience that I had because I learned a lot, 
we had a really good group of girls. It just was such a weird situation. Um, and I'm actually quite surprised that we were not more successful than we were on the field because we had some really good players. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I had talked to my agent just that I wanted to go overseas at some point. I was never really ready to take the take the plunge and, and make a move because I just, I knew it was going to be such a big life change and, and I wanted it to be as close to the perfect situation as possible. Although we all yep. know that doesn't exist, especially, you know, in no. sports, but um, <laughs> yeah, so it was, it actually is a pretty wild story. So this was Ooh, August 2018. of 2018. Right? Yeah, I, I yeah. wrote it down. It was August. She does, she does some good. Look she does some good you. research. You are just. I know. I try to do. Notch. I try to go based off memory and a little bit of Google and put it all together. Well, you're you're killing it. Uh, so this was the very end of the tra- the summer transfer window, and I wasn't had had no aspirations of going anywhere so soon. I thought, you know, I'll finish the season here and then you know figure out where to go from there. And obviously, and then nobody's have quite a significant off season. So I was definitely not expecting to jump a ride into a season, but my agent called me one day and he was like, this is going to sound kind of crazy, but Man City's looking for a forward. They think one of their players is going to leave, but they need a decision by tomorrow. And I was like, You're like, Am I as, back in college? Like, <laughs> as in like tomorrow, tomorrow. Recruiting. And he, yeah. he was like, uh, yeah, I know like that's crazy, but here's all these things. And I'm just like, well, let me call my mom. So, uh, yep. we I'll shout out back. moms we shout out moms yeah. on this podcast i'm going to europe tomorrow <laughs> i'm moving across the world um so i call her and i'm like i really think that i should do this and i don't feel any anxiety about it like i just think it's the right thing to do which i'm not an anxiety ridden person but i'm a very uh careful person and i try not to make uh decisions based on um what's it called uh, rash a rash decision motion yeah like just like motion. yeah just like irrational Rational decisions motion. yeah yeah just like I like to take my time and think things through but I did not have time for that so I'm like well she's like well if you want to do it I'm on board which is totally my mom like make your own decisions you'll suffer the consequences if it doesn't yeah. go well and I'm like love you too um and so she was like but yeah do it and so I called him back and I was like tell them I'm I'm interested and the same day I got on the phone with the coach, which at that time was Nick Cushing. He actually coaches in the MLS right now, which is cool. Um, and had a bit of a nightmare getting the transfer to go through just because it was like the weekend and no one's in the NWSL, uh, WSL office on the weekend. So then it's coming down to the wire and I'm like, we've not gotten the approval. The transfer window closes in two days. That's when I was like anxiety mm-hmm. central. And uh, at that point, my teammates knew that the transfer was in in the works. And that was, I think, kind of difficult for them to know that, like, in the midst of having this really difficult season, I was, like, trying to leave. And so I was trying to have those conversations with teammates, and, like, that's never easy. Um, mm-hmm. But, yeah, it was, it, was, it was a really wild week. Obviously, it all ended up fine, and, and we got the contract signed. So I think between him, my agent letting me know they were interested in me signing the contract was, like, six days. <sighs> Um, and then two weeks later I was here. Wow. That's insane. So I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah. I just can't get over you saying that the NWSL offices were closed two days before the window was closed. It was Go like figure. a weekend and then we were having the hardest time getting a hold of anyone at the office and we just needed like one signature. We're like, I get every other weekend, but like hmm. Transfer window like, closes in like can I get someone's hours? cell phone number? Yeah, like I'm just what? trying to go. Uh, oh my it was, god! Yeah, it I was wish I could wild. say I'm surprised, but I'm not. Like what? I would hope That's that nuts. you know, three years later, they've they have not had that same issue. Uh, it's all a learning process. It is. It's a growing yeah. growing pain. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, being here is incredible. When I came over, I had only signed a one year deal because my my thought process coming over here was I want to be in the best environment to train for the 2019 World Cup and, you know, be at the top of my game, which it was a difficult, difficult year. I uh, moved over here mm-hmm. not knowing a single person, didn't know anyone on the team, obviously. Uh, I had found my own apartment, but didn't have any furniture. So I'm literally like staying at the facility for my first week and then I had to fly back for a CONCACAF tournament that was like a month so I was here for a week and then gone for a month and then I came back and the same thing happened I was here for 10 days and then gone again for a international break so my first three months was I don't even remember it because it was just like travel uh but yeah so 
the first year was difficult. I decided to stick with it and ex- use the option that was on my contract for a second year. Mm-hmm. My second year was completely unexpected. I, one of my good friends who isn't on my team anymore, but um, tore ACL in one of the first games of the season. We didn't have a right fullback. And so don't know why, but I was the next best option. So I played fullback for pretty much my entire second season. Not a defender. Joe knows. I'm yeah. not a defender. <laughs> no. Uh, I was like, you put goals in the back of the net. You yes. don't stop don't, goals from going. Don't to keep them out. I put them in. Yeah. Uh, so, but so it's such a good experience. I really enjoyed that year. And then we got a new coach last year. Again, was another transition. Barely missed out on winning the league title. Uh, and then, you know, throw COVID in there. And that made things pretty crazy. And uh, yeah, we've had a bit of a rough beginning to this season but it's a long season so um yeah but I'm I'm so excited to still be here it's an insane club to be a part of um and yeah just being completely engulfed in the football culture uh we get to go to the men's games which is pretty amazing oh, yeah, that's... uh yeah so it's I really can't complain I have no complaints it's it's such a great club um I love being here and and hopefully if the season goes well I'll see myself here for a while longer yeah. Can you, I'm just curious, can you briefly touch on like facilities, all that is, would you say, are you guys kind of a lot of the same, you know, all the resources that the men get, or is there kind of a big disparity or how does that work? Um, I would not say there's a big disparity. Um, have you seen the, let's, let's uh, plug Amazon again. Have you seen the Amazon <laughs> all or nothing that they yes. did on the men's team? I have. And then I saw a picture with you. It kind of was weird. Cause you're like famous, but like, it was like, I saw a picture with you with the president and I was like, oh my God, she's with the president of Man City. But then like it all, you know what I mean? It's just so weird to like see them on that and then see how so, cool. Like- yeah, if they did a really, really good job of that documentary and it very much is true. That's really how things are for them um, more so than us. But we're we're in the same facility, but as you, you've probably seen in the documentary, the building is a circle. So mm-hmm. the men's first team side is one side of the building and then our side along with the academy. So we share a lot of our facility, most of our facility with the, the boys academy. So the um, elite development squad, which is under 23s and then the, the younger boys teams. And then in normal times, there's girls academy teams in there as well, but the younger ones aren't in the building right now because of COVID. Um, but yeah, I mean, the pitches are insane. So we have our own, our own pitch. So at the back of the That's facility great. the men have their own pitches the academy teams have theirs so there's not anyone like ever ripping up our field which is really nice That's awesome. and then we have uh, our own stadium that's on the ground which is great so we literally walk across the street from our facility and we're at our stadium which is so so nice we're so lucky wow. um and then yeah i mean in terms of like access to whatever we need if there is something on the men's first team side that we're you know in really like a lot of need like they have a crowd therapy crowd therapy cryotherapy chamber over there that we, that we use on occasion yeah it's really really cool they have a i'm gonna botch this word but a so, uh, i won't even know what it is hyperbaric chamber or something yeah, like that, yeah, right? yeah, 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 yeah. where you yeah. can change the like altitude and yeah, heat yeah, yeah. and all that so when we have injuries they take our players over there to to do their yeah. rehab and and do that change the the atmosphere and everything which is pretty cool um so yeah I mean like anything and everything we could need we have access to if we need it which is fantastic and then what I found really cool is that there is a lot of the men's first team players that are really interested in what's going on on our team um and we we don't have a lot of overlap with them just because their schedule's insane and, and we're not normally in the building at the same time but on occasion some appearances you know we we cross paths with them and, and they're great guys and are super interested in what's going on, excuse me, on our team. So yeah, it's been, it's been a really good experience. That's, that's exactly what you want to hear. Yeah. This strictly supports my theory that like, from just like a financial standpoint, it's not shocking the best facilities in the NWSL typically are owners that own an MLS team and a, like in Houston or in Orlando, or, um, I just think it's so critical because then you can share a lot or like maintain a lot and it's at a lower cost versus like one owner taking on like, which we're repairing to be fair, we're repairing, we're getting more, you know, small minority owners into the league, which is great. Um, But it's amazing to hear that on the international scale, because that's 
you would think that these clubs would have teams established for the women and it's kind of a newer thing. So to see that they're going about it in the right way and not kind of starting you at the bottom is really, really cool. Um, yeah. So getting into kind of these topics, cause, um, I will tell you, you're, a uh, Janine Becky is a great Twitter follow. Just oh, yes. thank you. Wow. Yes. That is so nice to hear. Very good yes. Twitter follow. And I'm not one to plug Twitter, but like you're a great Twitter follower. Oh, thank um, you. So I, you know, I went into the weeds myself, Joe. I did a little research. <laughs> very but, nice. Um, well, done. well done. Well done. I'm also, me and Joe are really, a lot of why we're doing this is very, we're also very um, motivated and inspired by what we can do and impact the women's game. And I know you're very, driven by that so i know common goal just announced that you're donating one percent of your salary which yeah like, <laughs> yes, you know, like, you. i mean let's just be real like we're not making millions of dollars and like for you to make that pledge and make that a priority just so people understand that supports gender equality women's empowerment um and i think that's just really off, like a really awesome approach i also think you're somebody out of the women that are leaders in women's soccer, you know, internationally, you do step out. And I think that's really challenging to do, which is why I'm talking about your Twitter kind of following. Um, what, what made you so passionate about social change? Why um, have you decided to take that choice? Because I do think there's ways to impact and maybe do it in a way that um, you don't have to kind of be vocal publicly. But I found, especially following you and kind of reading through your stuff. I, I think it's amazing what you're talking to and, and holding people accountable for. So talk us through kind of how you've grown into that kind of leader off the field um, and why it's so important to you. Yeah, that's a good question. I think first off, Common Goal is just an amazing organization and they make it so easy to want to be a part of it because they, you know, they support so many amazing foundations. They've got such a good group of players and, you know, they're, their motto, the reason, you know, they exist is so much about what I believe in, which is giving back and uh, being able to do that with my salary seems like, you know, seems like a big pledge because it's financial, but at the end of the day, it's like, well, if this is, you know, something that's going to help continue to grow the game and, and give people opportunity, then it's just like a no brainer for me. Um, and what's so cool about common goal is that you can actually change your pledge every year. So like okay. who you give it to so you're able to support multiple organizations over the course of however many years you decide to be a member which is awesome it's not it's not like you pick one organization and you're stuck in there and you can also divvy up a percentage of whatever you're giving to different organizations which is really amazing as well um and we decided as a national team that we were going to kind of do it as a team so there's lots of us that have that have joined common goal uh but in terms of myself uh publicly i just think it's just so important to use our platform. And I look around and I see, you know, all these athletes around the world, not just, you know, soccer players, but these athletes that have a bit of a wasted platform. And I just think for that sure. there's really, there's really no excuse for that. And it would be hard for me to believe that there's not a single thing that some of those people are passionate about. And yeah. if it's me, you know, sitting on my couch, writing a tweet about something that I just have an opinion on, and that sparks a conversation and then something comes out of that. Well, how hard was that for me to do? I'm sitting on my couch, like reading news that, you know, to put it blankly really pisses me off. And then I, and I can, I can start a conversation with, you know, typing a couple of words. So I just think there's a really no excuse to not use your platform. It's not hard. Uh, it doesn't take a lot of time. And, you know, even if it did, it's something that you're passionate about. And, um, you know, it is a bit of a, when I look at myself and, you know, the NWSL is a league that I want to return to at some point. So, you know, those topics in particular, and, you know, at the same time, I'm thinking about myself and a place that I want to come back to. And, and I left the league saying, you know, I hope to come back to this league when it's in a better place. And that doesn't mean that I can't support it while I'm not playing in it. Um, so, yeah. And then I just think in terms of, you know, being bold to step out and say what you want, that's the beauty of social media. And that's the beauty of, you know, the world that we live in right now, it's, is you know, we're allowed to say what we want and given a voice. And I'm very, very blessed to have as many people follow me that they do. So I do have great visibility and I want to use that to, to be a positive light, but at the same time, like you said, hold people accountable and yeah. start conversations and point out things that, you know, I think women specifically have settled for, for too long. That's just not where we're at anymore. 
and that's it's so important to highlight those things and it doesn't mean that my twitter is going to make a huge change but it starts conversations and i think that's what's most important is you know doing something like this just talking to each other about similar you know similar beliefs and and different opinions all the same i i think that's awesome because you were kind of the forefront of i was on the way so we have no Wi-Fi in my college office for some reason. It's down. So I had to drive back to my apartment to do the pod. And on the way back, I was listening to the Barstool's uh, CEO's podcast. And she always does like a more like a headline headlining news. And one of her headlining news is news news was like the NWSL having their championship. She brought it up at 9 a.m. at Providence Park on turf. And I'm like, Okay, that's really cool because I'm about to go interview the person who was probably one of the lead people on bringing light to that. And that like for me, like when I thought about that, I'm like, for you to still actively participate in wanting to grow the NWSL is something that I think is really important. Although you're not in it currently, you have been it, you're vocal about wanting to be back in it. It's so important that although the players that may be playing in it have a voice, but others around have to speak up because if other people around, it's not just the women in the league, it's women outside of the league. Mm -hmm. And I think that was, that was awesome that you, you spoke up and were so. Do you feel more empowered? Do you feel more empowered now that you're out of the league? Cause me and Joanna talk about this a lot. You know, I think the hardest part is because of where the league sits financially and kind of, frankly how a lot of these women really don't have much to stand on when it comes to like you know most girls are not making much they're working multiple jobs um I think constantly people are in fear of like something yeah you can't risk affect, you can't risk right? anything. something yeah. publicly affecting them do you think because you don't really have a stake in you know I think U.S. soccer obviously has a, a stake in NWSL and you're a Canadian player and now currently not in the league do you feel like maybe you you feel more of a sense of um responsibility to speak out more now knowing that maybe there are players that do have very similar opinions to you but maybe you're in fear of kind of putting them out publicly Um, yeah I think it's tough because you know I've had I've been in that situation in many environments like we there there are issues wherever you go right things you can talk about wherever you go it's the same story on the national team it's the same story at city like nothing's ever perfect and there's always something you can speak about but yeah, I think you have to have that in the back of your mind when when you're about to speak about your own team or your own league and to risk bad press and bad PR for your team, your league, your national team. You have to take that into consideration and go through the process of what are the implications of, of this? What is the truth behind what I'm saying? Can it be backed up? Like there, there's a process through going through these things. And I went through the same thing writing that tweet about the NWSL, but it's like you put yourself in that situation. Anyone that's ever played, anyone that's right. ever had to get up early in the morning, like yes, who so wants like to... when is pregame meal? Five thirty. Five a.m. Like, <laughs> what, what, like, of, like it was the same thing at the Olympics because the gold medal game was scheduled for eleven yeah. a.m. kickoff, and we're all like, "What?" <laughs> like eleven a.m. One, it's going to be horrifically hot, and two, no other game in the entire games was scheduled for eleven a.m. And we're just like, what's the deal? Like and the most important game. Yeah, like, and who's, yeah, anyways, um, that was, you know, great that they were so open to, to changing that and, and logistically it all worked out. It was, it was fantastic how fast they jumped on that. But that's just, they, like, it just goes to show there's not enough thought that goes through these decisions. And so when, you know, when you go through the process of all of those things, when, when you're involved, it's one, you have to be okay with potential backlash, which is always a risk. But I feel like when you do it, you build up a bit of a, a wall for criticism because it's not like I'm just going out and speaking about something that one, I don't believe in, or two, there's not truth behind, or three, there's not other people that will back my opinion. Yep. And you'll always yep. have the, you'll always have the people. There is always the people that come out of the woodwork. Well, it's about TV rights and college <laughs> football and like all these things. And I'm like, the more excuses you make, the more you're just proving my point, which is that I'm not talking about, it has to be above anything else. We're talking about visibility and growth of the women's game and investment. 
And if you're investing in it, you find a way yep. to put it, to put it in prime time. It, CBS, I guess, has the rights. I don't, I, like, I even said it on the tweet. I don't have the details. It's just the, the fact that it was scheduled at 9 a.m. is the just only never thing that matters. <laughs> It just should never happen. And That's at the end of the day, we fact. all we all want visibility. We all want all of that. But the number one priority is the players. And no yes. player should have to prepare to play a final at 9 a.m. No. And I was saying to some of my teammates here, because they don't know as much to how it works in the NWSL. So for us, like, the, for the very beginning of the season, we have four trophies to compete for. So we yeah. have the Champions League, right. the league title, the League Cup, and the FA Cup. So we have four potential finals. In the NWSL, there's one. One. So you're yep. talking about the championship game of the entire season. The it's 10 whole... month season this year. 10 yeah, months. 10 month season. And you're playing that entire season for one game. And that game is at 9 a.m. Like it's just like really, it just doesn't, I just don't understand how that doesn't make it penetrate someone's brain enough <laughs> to say this doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So that we got a bit off track there, but to answer your question, yeah, I think you always, you always, always risk something coming back when you choose to share an opinion, but as long as you, you know, think through it and, and get the facts straight, that's the other thing. If you're talking a bunch of BS, it'll always come out. And I think to your point and Joe, I'll let you get to the next question, but it's just, I think the most disheartening part for me this year as a fan, as a former player is just like, We've had such poor press and a lot of it has come out because no one spoke up and nobody in the league, which it's not the player's responsibility. It's the league's responsibility to highlight what is going wrong. And I think a lot of times we are, we are, we're like, we're backtracking. We're trying to like fix something that went wrong six months ago, instead of addressing it six months ago. And Mm -hmm. then it's, it's just a crapshoot. And Um, it's sad to me. And I know Joanna feels the same way. It's like, I don't want to keep hearing headline stories on major media outlets about negative. It's never about what you guys are doing pop like positively. It's always like, Oh my God, there's another scandal. The fourth coach in the league has to be terminated for cause because we didn't address this. Yeah. And it's just, no one knows why nobody knows why either. And it just goes, it's blown under the rug. Yeah. But um okay, to the big mama jamma. Oh god. You Mar-a-mama. are an Olympic gold medalist. <laughs> After back to back Canada having back to back bronze medal wins, you are finally a gold medalist. I have so many questions. <laughs> One, where do you keep it? And two, when that whistle blew, what in the world went through your head? It's funny you just said that and I just got chills again. Um, it currently, I, someone asked me this question earlier today. Uh-huh. It's so funny, the questions that people ask. Like, you know, you go through your, you think, oh, what would I ask someone if they won a gold medal? And you never think, like, I would never think, oh, I would ask them where they keep it, but I probably would. Yeah. It's just a really <laughs> funny question. Uh, right now, it's like, saying this publicly, it's like hidden behind some books on one of my shelves. It's in a little box, but I don't have a space for it or anything. So I'm like, if someone came in here- You're not just wearing it 24 seven in the shower when you go to bed. I I did for a while, but I did for a while. And then I thought, you know, this is- Your neck was hurting. You were getting a neck strain. Yeah, it's never going to fade in my mind, but other people might start to get annoyed by this. So yeah, it's it's pushed behind some books right now, but I definitely am going to find a better place for it. But currently that's where that is. And then your second question, when the whistle blew, oh gosh, it was just, that was probably the most anxiety ridden. Yeah, it was just, insane. Well, we'll God. just put it down to the penalties. What did that take <clears throat> like maybe 10 minutes total? Yeah. And I've never felt heartbreak and elation so many times in a span of 10 minutes. Uh, I could have slept for probably three days just from that experience. And then add everything else on there. And it was like, mm-hmm. I can't even describe it wild, but, um, yeah, I mean, I think it was just one of those things. Like you think I thought, oh my gosh, we've lost. And then, oh my gosh, we're back in it like four different times. Mm -hmm. And thankfully I've not spent a lot of time in my career and not on the pitch during Mm -hmm. uh, penalty shootouts. And I found myself in that situation twice in this tournament. 
And I must say, I much prefer being on the field because it is a lot less stressful. And I don't know why, because you stand up there halfway and it feels really <laughs> stressful. But then when you're on the sideline and you can't do anything about it, it's even worse. So I'm like, oh, you guys just yeah. get it done. And thankfully, <laughs> Steph, Steph Labe is a hero. And uh, yeah, just- Unsung hero. Had a hell yeah, just of a turn. Saves everything, just saves everything. So yeah, I mean- it was like the stars were aligned, the perfect storm of, of so many things happening for us. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's an incredible experience and yeah, something I'll never forget for sure. Joe, you know, this makes me think that we had Chalene on um, a couple months ago oh, and we got yeah. really into the whole kind of concept around like us and Canada, like kind of them treating you like a little brother, a little sister, if you want to call it. And um, of course we're both Americans, so we do support USA, but, um, just like being fans of soccer and seeing sync kind of get that like moment for herself and her country and just the elation and the performance you guys pulled off. Um, I know for myself, like wanting to see the game progress, it was like this underdog story that was just so amazing. And so it was so funny because we were talking about, she was just talking about the experience of every game you guys go into the US. It's like this amped, like you guys want to go out there and like prove it and to finally get it in that like big tournament stage. Um, if you're a soccer fan alone, it was just an incredible experience as a fan. I mean, me and Joe were like texting each other, like, Oh my God, this is insane. You know, what's so funny about you saying that is, uh, it's, it's true. Like every time we play the U S it, it's a bigger deal than other games. And I think we were careful to say that for so long because it's like, mm-hmm. Oh, it shouldn't be bigger than any other game, but that's the reality. Like it's a rivalry. You know, they've held the number one spot for a long time. Everyone wants to knock them off, blah, 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 all the things that everyone knows. And, uh, it was just strange because I think we approached this game in almost the opposite mindset. Like mm. it's just another game. It's just another sure. team in the way of us getting where we want to go. And everyone just like so bought into that. And there was just this feeling of complete, like just calm. And we know exactly what we're going to do. We know our game plan. We know how they can be exploited. We know how they could exploit us. And it was just like, everyone was, everyone knew exactly what they needed to do to make, that happen and that was the first time against the U.S. where I felt like wow we're actually better than them in this mm-hmm. game yeah. and not to say yeah, they sure. didn't put us under you know under the knife for for a while they served our box for about 20 minutes straight and I was like can we get it in our own half please <laughs> um, but you know that, that's the way tournaments work and uh, you know we won because we don't give away goals and that's the most important thing is you know keeping clean sheets and which is defending for your life against the U.S. Yeah, yeah. When you you know you start whoever they started, and then you see you know Alex Morgan, Megan Rapino, Kristen Press all getting ready to come on, and you're like, okay, <laughs> like it's been seventy five minutes. <laughs> I'm tired. <laughs> they have fresh legs, and right. they're some of the best players in the world. So yeah, I mean we have without it goes without saying we have massive massive respect for the u.s and the rivalry is so healthy and it's so great um and i think yeah to be honest i think that they now you know have to give us some respect that probably wasn't there before so it's not a bad thing makes the rivalry even even more fiery so yeah uh, definitely excited for the next time we get to play them yeah i think it's really cool too because that canada roster was it was kind of that core of like a lot of girls that were super, super successful in the college game. So like Quinn, you, Jesse Fleming, um, Prince, like a lot of those girls were very, very successful in college and was kind of all around our age group. So it was cool to see behind the scenes that like that you, the youth teams were successful. The the 17s were successful. The 20s were successful. And it's just a slow, slow climb. Whereas all of a sudden you may think that Canada is all of a sudden on top, but it's like, this has been a grind for the past seven years to develop this team into a gold medal. And then you just couple that with sync and some of the old heads (laughs) and bada bing, bada boom. She's literally timeless. I'm like, this girl, she's timeless. Literally her game just gets better (sighs) to adjust. I'm like, what the hell? Like, I don't think that anyone, uh, Maybe like Messi and Ronaldo, but other than that, I just don't think that the goat describes anyone else better than her. So sure. yeah, she's un- she's unreal, and it's just so funny because she's just the like 
most goofy, funny, humble human being you'll ever meet. And then she's just like this is like she has a second identity when she's on the field and it's just like do not yeah. mess with me I mean she's she terrifies me and we're on the same team so it's <laughs> it's you know it, it happens we're good everything's good um but yeah she's she's incredible and and to be able to you know I don't know what what the plan is for her in terms of internationally I more than anything hope she continues to play but at the same time we'll completely understand if she yeah. wants to hang up the boots with a gold medal because there's not many other ways to go out um but yeah I mean it was we have a great team and I think we uh we just have a team of a lot of really good players and that is uh, hard to deal with yeah. Yeah. when you're the yeah. other team <laughs> obviously like the peak I would think of your career or at least one of the you know greatest points of your career obviously was this summer but um to kind of like end it today we wanted to also talk to you about because you're just so insightful and I feel like you'd have great advice on this um, despite all the success and having played in a lot of teams, started for a lot of teams, um, we wanted to talk a little bit about kind of the adversity you've hit in your career and advice that you would have for anybody navigating disappointment, um, and looking to turn that moment of disappointment into an opportunity to, um, kind of look towards the future and say, okay, I didn't get this opportunity, but there's things still for me to go after. So mm -hmm. I think people probably don't even know this, but you didn't make the 2015 World Cup roster, um, which looking at your career now, I wouldn't, I actually had to check with Joe because I was like, <laughs> you know, my memory didn't, you know. Um, but obviously it's clear you took that kind of point of disappointment and it didn't deter you, right? Your goals stayed the same. You kept pursuing your career and getting better. Um, talk through that process and like any advice you'd have for players that are, maybe in those moments or will face those moments and need to find kind of the other side of it. Right. Not yeah. Focus yeah. too much on the, the moment. I think if you take a batch of, you know, some of the best players in the world or players that have, you know, like me been successful on the international stage still have a lot to go, but, you know, have done, have done some good things. You'd be surprised to find that, most people will have had an experience like me where, yeah, I, I am still dealing with that. The, you know, I don't start every game. I don't play all the minutes sure. here. Do I want to? Absolutely. Who wouldn't, but yeah, I didn't make that team. And at the time that was complete devastation and everything's easier to look back with hindsight. Mm -hmm. Hindsight's a beautiful thing. So glad that it, it, it exists because <laughs> yeah. what would we do without it? I don't yeah. know. I don't know what I would do. <laughs> looking back on that experience what was said to me at the time is we just don't think you're ready and that's a hard pill for anyone to swallow and a hard pill for a young person who's just spent back then we we did residency so spent five months of two a days living mm. in Vancouver away from at the time being with my teammates back at school and then all of a sudden everything that you quote worked for is just like no oh, you won't be there and it's one of those things that I I think my advice would be, you have to be so clear about what you're doing and why you're doing it. Because if you're not clear on the purpose behind something, you're not, your actions aren't going to follow that. So we used to say on the national team all the time, like, see it, say it, do it, which sounds really cliche, but it's cliches are cliche for a reason because they like make right. sense. Right. So, you know, you, and that was the same thing with our our tournament this summer, we said, we want to change the color of the medal. And then we went and we did it. And there's so much power behind committing, committing something to yourself, committing something to, to a group, to a bigger, whatever committee, community, whatever you want to call it. And then actually following through on, on your intentions. And so for me, I, you know, I went and I went into residency and my goal was make the world cup roster, but then what do you do when, when that reality is all of a sudden crushed, well, it's okay. What's next? And yeah, everyone has their moments to, I cried. I was pissed. Like it didn't make sense. I probably, you know, said some not very nice things about how I was feeling and, and everyone has to go through the, the, that process. It's not just like you were human beings. We have emotions. It's not just like you can switch and be like, okay, like what's next? I'm ready. And thankfully that summer was the 2015 Pan Am games and they had, you know, followed my, cut from the roster with you'll be a really important player for this tournament we want you to be there 
want you to enjoy the experience and you know this isn't going to be the end of the road for you with the national team but at the same time it very well could have been if I chose if I said I don't want to do this anymore and for me my purpose was just really clear it's what I wanted to do I wanted to play in the world cup was my dream and thankfully again the way the schedule works uh, in another year I had a chance to make another roster and so for from the minute that I got cut to the minute that I found out I was on the Olympic roster it was I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that I don't feel this way again and thankfully I haven't felt that way again in my (laughs) career Uh, let's let's hope that I don't feel that way again before I decide to retire Um, But yeah, I just think like my advice would be everybody, adversity is just a part of life and challenge and disappointment, like people are disappointing. People are going to disappoint you. Circumstance is going to disappoint you. It's just the way that the world works. And if you have a, you know, pessimistic mindset of, well, I'm doomed, there's disappointment ahead of me. You're just probably not going to be a very <laughs> fun, happy person, are you? But um, I'm, you know, I'm so lucky I get to kick a ball around a field for my job. So, you know, when I try and, and shift my perspective, think about it that way, the small disappointments that come along the way are that just don't seem as big. Um, and it's easy to it's easy to say when things are going well, you know, I'm off the back of a gold medal and that's fantastic. But I also, like I just said, I'm dealing with trying to you know make my spot in the team every week and yeah it's just it's just constant like that's just the way that life works and I'm so thankful to have had that experience at such a young age because I've I've learned but I continue to learn I don't handle things the right way all the time like I just think you have to that's a lot of words but in 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 summary be optimistic understand the challenge is coming whatever form it comes in might be big might be small disappointment will happen especially in sport but you know be grateful be joyful in what you do try and be clear on your purpose as much as possible and I will always say being a good person comes back around always be a good person because even when you don't want to be which everyone has those days (laughs) pushing through and and putting smile on your face and, and making someone around you feel good always pays off and um for sure yeah I think that's what I try and emulate every day that you just pretty much what a way to end a freaking podcast (laughs) I mean in those 50 minutes you just dropped wisdom experience maturation everything under the sun uh that I can't wait for people to listen to this this is truly incredible um but something we like to do to kind of end things is a little bit of a rapid fire just to oh, kind of get to know Genevieve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Let's do it. Favorite coffee drink. Oh, God. <laughs> Coming in with a... Coffee is... <laughs> if anybody knows me, I used to... I'm going to answer this question not rapidly. Uh, I used to hate coffee. I was like, okay. this tastes disgusting. Why do people like this? Uh-huh. And then I was having a really hard time with jet lag and I was like forcing it down. And I was uh-huh. like, you know what? This, this stuff works. <laughs> and then the more I drink it, the more I started to like it. So answer your question. Uh, iced Americano with oat milk is my favorite. Ooh, an iced Americano, it, I'll have to try that. Sometimes with a little bit of vanilla if I'm feeling wild. Okay. Describe yourself in three words. Uh, bubbly, um, dedicated, mm, fun. Love it. Your favorite team to play. Ooh, I love when we play Chelsea. I love playing Chelsea at the club okay. state club level internationally. Uh, I love playing Brazil. We always play really, really well against Brazil. Yeah, y'all do. Y'all do. Your current favorite takeout? Indian, Indian food. Mm, like a heck yeah. yeah, like a butter chicken with a good non bread. Ooh yeah wow doesn't get much deal, better man. than that yeah. yeah television show you've recently binged this is so embarrassing uh for the second time watching vampire diaries nice okay always a good one and your current favorite teammate they could have bought you coffee they could have picked you up for practice 
Oh gosh, it's a hard could have could have bought you a drink after the the Olympic party. Uh, all right, we'll go national team and city. One of my favorite people in the universe is Jessie Fleming. Um, she's uh-huh. one of my closest friends. Makes me laugh. We were on Facetime last night. She's just an absolute goof. Um, <laughs> love her. Oh, God, I love all my teammates. It's yeah. a hard question. Um. Ellie Roebuck, who is a goalkeeper for England and our goalkeeper at City, literally moved in across the street from me. Nice. And so we spend a lot of time together. She has a key to my apartment. I have a key to hers. Sometimes she just shows up. Um, So that's been really, really fun to to hang out with her more. And I was just with her. She was getting the Olympic rings tattooed on her arm. And I went with her. Nice. So that that was cool. She was probably the teammate teammate I was just with. So Yeah, perfect. Perfect. Well, Janine, thank you so much for joining us on this pod. This was awesome. Of course. Thank you guys so much for having me. What a great podcast with Janine Becky. Such a leader in our sport and truly incredible soccer player, a gold medalist. She dropped some serious knowledge out there. So hope you guys just enjoyed it. Uh, Next week on the pod, we have Dr. Brad Miller, founder of Soccer Resilience. He really dives into all the tips and tricks on how to handle the mental side of the game. Uh, He he really goes into it, and it's super exciting, and we can't wait for you guys to listen to it and to learn from it. Uh, So we'll see you next week.